Uh, yep. Yep. Um, so, uh, I guess now I'll just wait for people to, uh, wait for people to check in. Do, 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 do. I know I said half past six, but I mean we're two minutes off, right? Two minutes off. Hello, Owen Rollins, if that is your real name. Uh, this is interesting because you've just said hello in the chat, and it's according to the uh, according to my little dashboard. It says there's no one watching, which is obviously a lie. Um, but anyway, I'll uh, I'll give a few give a few minutes for uh, for people to arrive. Maybe if I um, let me just refresh this page and see if that makes any difference. Nope. Now it says there's no one watching. Nope. Two people watching. Okay, well, I mean, that'll, that'll sort itself out. Um, cool, so at the moment we've got Owen, we've got Alex. I have not marked your test yet, Alex. Um, do not despair. I'm sure everything will be fine. We've got blessed. Um, so I am going to... Oh, what's going on here? Um, we've got two blesseds. Uh, in intra tres interessant or something DW yep I don't know what that means different why have you got two different accounts are you uh, are you up to some illegal shenanigans no, <laughs> right good okay I'm not worried why would I worry I there's nothing for me to worry about right I, you ever known me to worry about anything nope <sighs> right Oh god, oh god, this tea tastes terrible. I made myself some jasmine green tea and it's absolutely awful. But um Yep. Yep, gonna have to deal with it. Gonna have to deal with it. Hello Bill Nye, um the science guy. I hope it's the actual Bill Nye. That would be the greatest thing that's ever happened to me uh in my life. So, uh it is currently at 6.30. At about um, 6.35, um, about 6.35, we'll, we'll, we'll kick it off. You'll notice in the um, uh, in the window down there, I have mentioned... Um, oh, Celtic Spy, I know who that is there. Uh, I've, I've mentioned like four, four things, system architecture, ethics, uh, legal and system security. Uh, those are the topics that I was planning on covering uh, in various uh, degrees of depth uh, throughout the course of tonight's stream. Uh, if there's any you'd particularly like to go over first, I mean, the, uh, the, the stuff that I've got on the screen at the moment obviously pertains to um, system security. Uh, I will let you discuss amongst yourselves how you think this pertains to system security and what you think uh, this is all about. Now, obviously, Alex uh, has recently had this lesson, so it's going to be fresh in his mind, but uh, the rest of you, uh, feel free to uh, to discuss what do you think these images that are on the screen, what do you think they, uh, what, what relevance do they have, how do they relate to system security? ways of logging into a computer system recognition can you be more specific with the uh, the old recognition yes they are all ways of authentication um can you can you say what they are i mean um this one over here if we go from if we start at the top and go from left to right so we've got this one this one and this one and then this one and this one um Oh, oh, yeah! It is a retina and not an iris. Although there are um, iris scanners as part of a uh, biometric um, uh, monitoring system. So, um, so yeah, as uh, as was quite 
pointed out, uh, quite rightly pointed out, this is uh, biometrics. Um, biometrics is a one measure of system security uh, and it's making sure uh, that uh, the right person logs in by actually linking um, the data stored uh, that, that is attached to their login, linking that directly to some physical aspect of their being. Everyone has a unique fingerprint in theory. Uh, everyone has a unique pattern of veins on their retina. Um, interestingly enough, everyone has a different style of walking. Uh, this refers to something known as gait analysis. Okay, that's gait spelt like that. Uh, and gait analysis basically analyzes the way that you walk um, and uh, it can uh, it can identify you as a person. Um, if you've seen, there's a Mission Impossible film where they use gate analysis, um, and uh, I mean it's obviously not realistic in the slightest, but yeah, it's it's a thing. Down here we've got DNA. Um, some uh, high security systems will require you to put your finger on a little pad, uh, and a little needle shoots up and takes a sample of your blood, uh, and then it can match it with the uh, DNA. Uh, stored on um, uh, on record and then um, uh, your voice analysis. What if two people have a very similar walk or voice? They might be very similar but they are not identical and so um, the most sophisticated systems will be able to uh, tell them apart even if we as human beings perhaps could not tell them apart. Uh, if you compare two different people talking, even if it sounds the same, if you compare them on an oscilloscope uh, you will not get the same waveform. Um, but uh, obviously uh, there's there's room for error uh, you know you will get false positives but uh, you don't need to know the ins and outs of all of the different types of biometrics all you need to know is uh, that biometrics is a method of system security uh, which ties uh, access to the system to a physical part of your body uh, or or your being all right, uh, right. It's uh, it's twenty five two now. Um, if you want, we can carry on with the system security. I've got a whole bunch of uh, stuff on system security. Uh, if you'd prefer, we could we could skip to one of the other uh, things I've mentioned down there. So uh, you guys, let me know uh, what is what is your preferred um, revision topic right now. We have one vote for security. Uh, bear in mind, Alex, uh, the Year 11's votes are going to uh, uh, take precedence over yours. We've got one for security, one for system architecture, one for utility. Well, I covered I covered utilities in the previous stream. Uh, so utility software, things like uh, antivirus, defrag, and uh, and stuff like that. Covered that in the previous stream. So if you need to know about that. You can go back and, uh, and and look at the previous stream. There might be some time to sort of like plug in any gaps uh, a little bit later on. Uh, I literally don't know anything about system security, so that please. Right, okay, so um, how about this? We will do system security and then um, system architecture. Maybe a, a few little bits and bobs to, uh, to fill in and then look at um, uh, legal issues and ethics. Uh, towards the end of the stream, um, and then we'll, we'll, you know, we, we can have some time to sort of like, you know, do any other other bits and bobs. Does that sound fair? Yep. Oh, incidentally, remember I said I was going to wear a hat. I I did get my hat. Uh, the problem is I can't wear the hat and the headset at the same time. So if you just bear with me a sec. Yeah, there's 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 the hat. Um, you can see it's got it's even got these are real feathers that I picked up while I was hiking. Uh, one of them is from a grouse, I think, and one of them is from a crow. Um, so I can't actually I can't I can't wear the headphones. Don't fit on at the same time, and I can't put the hat over the uh, over the thing. So um, um, maybe there'll there'll be there'll be some time uh, for me to show you the various hats that I own. 
Um, so uh, yeah, I know, smooth, smooth AF. Um, just you wait until my cravat arrives, and then the cravat and the hat. What an a, a award-winning combo! You know, it is it is a, astonishing that I'm still single. Um, right. So here we go. Let's do some uh, security. Uh, right, uh, biometrics. Uh, let, yeah, good. Um, now, obviously, um, the whole point of this little presentation that I've got here is to run down uh, ways to... Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know where this whole Miss Ascot thing came from. It's, a, it's, a, it's not remotely true. Um, so uh, we'll look at ways to protect a computer system from attack, understand the role of a penetration tester, which is something you need to know about, uh, and we'll look at uh, network policy, because that's something that crops up. Uh, one of the things that you can say about how to prevent uh, access to uh, um, unauthorized access to a computer system uh, is by having a sound network policy. So we'll have a, uh, we'll have a look at that as well. OK. Um, just before we get cracking, can any of you uh, suggest, like, just off the top of your head, a way to protect a computer system from attack? And that might be attack from the internet, or it might be an attack from someone sat at the computer. Yes, a firewall is a uh, uh, is a good idea. A physical lock is a good idea as well. That's something that a lot of people um, miss out. Uh, Disconnecting it from the internet, yeah, that's good. Passwords is the obvious one. Uh, Two-factor authentication is a, uh, a good one there. Um, face ID, yeah, I mean, any of those biometric uh, things. Cool. Uh, break the computer. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, that will potentially prevent it from attack. Um, but if you break the computer and you don't destroy the data on the hard disk, someone could still take the hard disk out and extract that data. Um, antivirus, yes, to an extent. Um, yeah, okay, I'll go along with antivirus. Let's say antivirus. Ultrasonic finger scanner. Yeah, that falls under the general category of um, uh, of, of biometrics. Okay, so I'll tell you what. Let's uh, let's go through them in the order that I've got on my on my thing here, and we'll uh, we'll sort of like have some discussions uh, around that as we uh, as we go through. Um, I do have uh, something else specifically related to malware uh, and something else specifically related to other uh, act, uh, things about system security. You've not you've not missed much, Callum. Uh, we've just we've just really gotten started, so we we basically sorted out the order we're going to go through this stuff. Okay, um, so. Antivirus software. Antivirus software is an example of utility software. Remember, utility software is something that um, helps your computer to run, um, and it's not something that you sit and just use actively. It runs in the background, and it's uh, it's it's keeping your uh, computer running smoothly. So, an antivirus is going to scan. It scans the files that are already on the computer, and it also um, will. Um, uh, scan any files that you download as you download them. Well, the good ones do it as you download them. Um, but the I've put a question on here: Why why does antivirus software need to be uh, updated regularly? Um, and why does it sometimes give false positives? Two great answers there. Um, new viruses are coming out all the time and a lot of the new viruses uh, people will uh, take old viruses and modify them a little bit okay so they can look similar um, but um, but things will um, often um, the, you know you get hundreds of new viruses every day so if your database is not kept up to date the antivirus won't know what to look for now some antivirus systems uh, will use what's known as heuristics uh, to uh, to check your file so it might detect something which is not actually in its database but it looks so similar to something that it that is in the database that it'll say I reckon that's probably a virus you know it kind of looks like a virus um, and uh, that's what gives rise to false positives. There might be certain um, chains of code in some of your programs that look like um, they could be viruses. Whereas, it, in fact, it's legitimate software. I actually got uh, banned from my own web host uh, for uploading a file which it detected as a virus. Uh, and I had to phone them up and say, 
the Senna virus guys um, and uh, and 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 get reinstated. I still couldn't upload the file because they didn't trust me, but they they reinstated my uh, my thing. Yeah, smells like a virus, looks like a virus. Must be Winra. Winra is actually pretty pretty good, although I. I'd probably use 7-Zip. Uh, WinRAR and 7-Zip out of interest. Just another couple of examples of utility programs there. Um, okay, cool. So antivirus. We're clear on antivirus. Right? We know what a virus is, right? You know what, what a virus is? Um, we'll have a look in depth at the different types of viruses uh, in a little while. All right. Uh, you use WinRAR. Did you pay for WinRAR? That's the question. Has anyone ever paid for WinRAR? That is the question. Um Next up, our next utility is a firewall. Um, the firewall serves two purposes. Now, the first one um, is this is supposed to be an animated GIF. I don't know why it's not. You know, it's it's. Oh man, it's ruined my ruin my anime theme. Never mind. Uh, so, a firewall pre prevents attacks from outside the computer or outside the network. Okay, but. It also stops data that's already on the network or already on the system from getting out onto the internet. And that's that's something that a lot of people forget. The firewall is two ways, yes. And it works by blocking ports. Okay, so if you imagine... Uh, if you imagine your computer system is a uh, a big block of flats, a high-rise tower building, right? There are number there are a number of different ways into that building. Okay, you can climb through any window that is open. So if you close the windows, you stop people getting in. Now, web traffic and internet traffic. Each different type of network traffic will use a different port. For instance, uh, HTTP, which is uh, websites, generally that uses port 80. Um, what else is there? Uh, email uses port 21 usually. Uh, SSH, I think, is port 22. Um, Zonotic uses uh, port uh, 2000, no, 26,000, I think. Uh, but the point is. If you want to stop that type of traffic coming through, um, it will. Um, you can close the port, and it will stop that traffic coming through. Okay, um, and also you can. If you close that port, you can stop the traffic getting out. You can also open and close ports um, so that you can allow traffic out through the port but not allow traffic in. You can also allow traffic in through the port but not out. Okay, so you have quite a lot of control over this thing. Um, oh, look, I've got some port numbers here. Uh, ports are the only routes into or out of a system. So HTTP uses port 80. Uh, if you want to find out what port HTTPS uses, I'm sure you can uh, you can look that up. But the thing is, there's no guarantee that HTTP will always use port 80. By default, it will use port 80. But um, we can specify like specific ports that it can use so don't be fooled into thinking that um, you know blocking those ports will automatically stop all of that type of traffic sometimes um, other traffic nasty traffic can get through on open ports that are meant for different uh, services and so one of the things that we can uh, we can do is we can scan the packets that are coming in and look at what type of packet they are and if it's a, a, a packet that we don't want like for instance a BitTorrent packet on a school network we'll just say nope block that regardless of what port it's coming through uh, what's the difference between all the ports there is no difference uh, every single port it's just a route into the system it's just that certain um, network traffic by default uses certain ports okay so if you have port 80 open generally it's for web traffic how many ports are there now that's a good question loads uh, let's just do a uh, let's just do a, a quick a quick check how many network ports are there in a TCP IP network does it say um, right so technically Technically, there's that magic number. 
65,535, but some of them are reserved. Um, so the first 1,024 port numbers are reserved uh, for things like FTP and HTTP and stuff like that, which means that if you want to use custom ports, uh, there's only 64,511 of them available. So in total, 135. Just for a little bit of extra credit, if there's 65,535 ports, how many bits do you reckon are used um, to uh, control uh, the port number? Yes, very many. You should know this. I'll give you a clue, it's more than 8. It's not 128. 128 bits is a is a going to be a vast number. Remember, it's 2 raised to the power of whatever this number is. It is not 64, keep guessing. Not 48. It's more than 9. 16. Boom, Jack wins. Uh yeah. Uh 2 raised to the power of 16 is 65,536. Okay, so there you go. Um, but you don't need to know that for the exam. You won't be asked that, but it's just some interesting bit of information. And questions like that are likely to come up on paper two, so knowing your powers of two uh, can be useful. Uh, cool. Any more questions on firewalls or antivirus before we move on to the next bit? Hello. Hello, Actopus the Great. Nine. Right, okay, cool. So, fingers crossed, firewalls, utilities, uh, sorry, antivirus, um, those methods of protecting your computer, you've got an idea of, uh, of that. Um, I'm not sure what this video is. I'm scared to play it. Um... Oh, it's this. What is penetration testing? Has become an integral part of a comprehensive security program. I mean, a simulated attack on systems or an entire IT. Look at this guy. Pen tests expose the weakness in your core attack vectors, operating systems, network devices, and application software. The idea is to find and secure vulnerabilities before attackers exploit them. <sighs> Pen testing has never been more important than it is today, with DDoS attacks, phishing, ransomware, and countless other tactics used by increasingly sophisticated cyber criminals. The best defense starts with knowing your strengths and weaknesses. As Sun Tzu wrote in The Art of War, <laughs> if ignorant of your enemy and yourself, you are certain to be in peril. That's right. Pen testing provides intelligence and insight into how to mature your security organization by understanding how you could be and likely will be attacked and what steps you need to take to secure your organization. However, penetration tests are not created equal. If you were to Google pen tests, you would likely find an assortment of companies offering to conduct inexpensive, fast tests geared to help meter your PCI requirement or some other compliance standard. Pen tests need to be about more than checking a box. They need to be the critical starting point to improved cyber defense. Further, one important thing to remember, vulnerability assessments are not pen tests. Vulnerability assessments provide a prioritized list of vulnerabilities and how to remediate them. Quality pen tests have a goal in mind, whether that is to hack into a specific system, breach a database, or simply probe as an attacker would to find hackable systems. Pen tests are conducted by ethical hackers to mimic the strategies and actions of an attacker. The five steps in pen testing should be one, find a vulnerability. Two, design an attack. Three, appoint team of ethical hackers. Four, determine what kind of data they could steal. 
five, act on the findings. Quality penetration tests should give you deep insight into the organization's overall security posture, and more importantly, how to prioritize vulnerabilities found in the test and eliminate them in order to improve the organization's security maturity. Right, so um, I will uh, I will put a link to that video in the um, in the description when I get round to it. I should credit whoever made that, but at the moment I do not know. In fact, let's I have the that is the video URL. I don't know if I have permission to use that, so I might be violating one of the acts of law that we are going to look at later. Can you tell me what act of law that might be? Yeah, what's the full name of it? It's not just copyright. It's not just the Copyright Act. There's more to it than just copyright. Don't need to. It's not 1998. It's 1988. It's not the Copyright Infringement Act. Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act. That's the one. Okay, that is the one. Okay. Um. So that video. I mean, that's a reasonable description. I mean, if if I didn't think it was a half decent video, I wouldn't have put it in my presentation, right? Um. So penetration testing. Um. Hopefully, from that, you've got an idea of what it is. It's literally checking a system for weaknesses. Um. But usually, a penetration test has a specific focus. So the company will say, right, we've just set up this new payment server. We need to make sure if the payment server is secure. Now, don't worry about trying to break into any of the other parts of the network. We just want you to focus on the payment server. Try and break it. Okay, and so these hackers will try and break the, um, uh, the security. And when they break the security, uh, they can then uh, say to the company, right, this is how we got in. This is how you can fix it. Then the company will go and fix it and then they will try again okay and because it might be that in the process of fixing it they've managed to open up some other doors okay so um, uh, welcome to the uh, to the stream tumblr queen um, oh, that almost rhymes um, but the thing is right pen testing there's no point doing pen testing after someone has compromised you I mean yeah, you can you can plug the gaps, but the damage has already been done, right? So the idea is that you get the penetration testing done before you go live, ideally, or at least before anyone has been able to actually compromise your um, uh, your security. Okay. Um, the point that they made about um, not just going on Google and finding the cheapest or quickest penetration test—that's um, 100% true. Um, in penetration testing you definitely get what you pay for and it is worth paying more money uh, so that you can be uh, sure that it is uh, you know 100% secure now that said however be aware there's probably going to be a bunch of rip-off merchants out there that will charge the earth and still not do a decent job uh, and that's why um, you cannot tell the quality of a service based on the cost of that service what you need to do is make sure that you uh, you get your services from a reputable uh, penetration testing um, firm okay um, I mean that you don't really need to know much more about penetration testing than that you need to know that penetration testing is uh, uh, groups of hackers trying to hack into a network specifically um, and uh, uh, they will have a specific focus for what they're trying to attack and the idea is when they find the weaknesses they are able to say to the company uh, how to improve them um, when I was on uh, Dungeons and Dragons Online, Lord of the Rings Online, uh, we had a couple of people who would uh, they were they were not employed by us. They were members of the community. Uh, and every so often they find out a way that they could cheat in game and so they would uh, email in and say I managed to do this this is an exploit you need to fix that and so we'd look at that and then we'd have to uh, uh, fix the code uh, and then uh, make sure that no one could uh, no one could cheat hello Lula whoever whoever you may be um, so next up uh, just before I move on to network policy has anyone got any questions about penetration testing um, 
just saying, just responding to what Alex said earlier, if your dad keeps banging on about pen testing, it's probably because it's a very lucrative industry at the moment and there's a lot of people uh, who don't have the skills to do it. And so if you can get the skills to do it, uh, you, you're going to have a, uh, you know, going to be pretty much guaranteed a job, just like if you're a decent computer science teacher who knows how to program. Uh... I mean, I would, I would wager that there probably hasn't been any pen testing done on the school website. Um, but having said that, if someone managed to hack the school website, it's not like there's any sensitive data stored on there, so it's not so much of an issue. I would imagine that uh, there has been some penetration testing done on the school network as a whole, especially the areas where we store things like student records, because it is the school's responsibility to make sure that all of that stuff is stored safely, as you will know when we get on to the legal thing, because that's a specific act of law which is known as the what? Yes, the Data Protection Act. Um, good. So we'll we will we will crack on with that. So if there's no more um, no more uh, GDPR, not GDPT. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, but GDPR. Let's let's. Our UK Act of Law is still called the Data Protection Act, right? GDPR is the European uh, uh, General Data Protection Regulation, which has to be incorporated into the individual member states' laws, of which ours is the Data Protection Act. If that's confusing, then you know that's that's why lawyers get paid so much. Um, so uh, next up. Um, if you uh, just one final call, any any further questions on penetration testing before I move on to the next bit? Nope. Good. Good. Wow, we've got twelve people watching. Cool. Um, Grey hats. Um, right. So yeah. Okay. Um, so for those of you that don't know, um, in the hacking uh, community, uh, there are sort of there's three types of hackers. There's uh, white hats who use their powers for good. Uh, there's black hats who use their powers for evil. And there's grey hats who are sort of like in the middle. Um, they will use their powers for uh, whatever seems most sensible at the time that you know usually the the gray hats are the ones who are employed to do this sort of thing the white hats will um, do this sort of thing out of the goodness of their heart and the black hats will do this sort of thing uh, and not actually tell anyone how to fix the issues because they're just in it for themselves there you go. Um, in reality it's not so clear-cut as you will probably be aware the real world is a messy place okay uh, would GCHQ be classed as grey hats? Yes. Uh, yes, they would. Um, yeah, no, they're not required to remove um, uh, teachers' work emails. It's frustrating for me as well because there's four Mr. Smiths. Um, obviously, people try and contact me and it gets sent to a different Mr. Smith and I never see it. Um, would, uh, what would they ask about penetration testing on the exam? Um, it's m it, you are more likely uh, to get a um, an indirect question about penetration testing. Okay, so it's more likely to be uh, a case of uh, there'll be a question saying um, uh, state how or, or explain how you can uh, ensure uh, your system is kept secure. You know, it's it's unlikely they'll say what is penetration testing. Okay, it's more going to be a case of like. Uh, in a question where you're being asked about system security, uh, talking about penetration testing is going to be one of the points that you can make in order to get the marks. Okay. Um, so then, let's talk about network policy. Um, now, network policy, a lot of the time, is just common sense. Um, and... If you have a question about network policy, 
the best thing for you to do, you all use computer networks at school. So think about what the school network policy is because usually, not always, usually uh, the school network policies are, are not, not too bad. Okay, So network policy is a list of rules or best practice while using a network and a lot of the time if you're employed by a company or if you are using uh, that company's uh, equipment you will have to sign or agree to um, a network policy document uh, and it will say things like uh, you must have a, uh, a strong uh, password uh, each user has their own individual username. Um, a decent network policy will allow the users to change their password regularly. In fact, the best network policies will require the users to change their password regularly, like every couple of months or so. Um, another um, element of network policy is having different uh, groups set up so that different um, access levels can be set. For instance, in school, teachers have access to a um, uh, some shared network resources that the students do not have access to. My internet access at school is different to your internet access at school because I have more uh, reign over like which sites I can access and things like that. Okay, so when it comes to network policy, if there's a question about network policy, um, it's likely to be something along the lines of, um, you know, suggest how a strong network policy can improve the system security of this blah, 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 blah. In which case, you just need to mention a few things that you think are good network policy. Obviously, strong passwords is the obvious one. Uh, having um, uh, separate user access levels for different uh, tiers of, of uh, access is another one. Um, and uh, and uh, uh, making uh, blocking uh, bad websites, um, obviously, um, it would be a bit foolish of us uh, to just allow you to access any websites because no doubt there'd be uh, uh, stuff that's unsuitable for uh, uh, for children to view um, and a lot of the time the websites that harbour the filth also harbour the viruses and so uh, 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 there's I don't know if you guys have noticed, but if you try and create a zip file on the school computers, uh, or if you try and save an audio file on the school computers, um, it's not, uh, it, you, you cannot do that. You don't have permissions to do that. Um, however, um, because I think it's necessary for you as students to be able to do that, uh, I have requested some. Uh, um, uh, some workarounds for that. So if you create a zip file with my initials at the start of it, you should be able to, uh, to save it. Yeah, not MSC, but if you put KES, MSC is he's no longer at the school, so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, the school's passwords are definitely not strong, um, but I mean, that's, that's a bone of contention that I'm working on getting fixed. I will try, I will keep on trying my hardest. Um, you know, it's out of my hands right now. Um, so I mean, that's network policy. Uh, that's really that's that's sort of like uh, that concludes the little bit on um, keeping systems secure. Um, is there any uh, are there any other sort of like questions that you have? Uh, oh, one thing about um, uh, passwords. I don't know if you're aware of this, but if you type your password into uh, the um, the chat, if you type your password into the YouTube chat, it all, it detects that it's a password and it will automatically convert it to uh, to asterisk. So, for instance, if I type in my password here, um, when I when I send that as a message, you can see it's automatically changed it to the uh, the stars. Yeah, now obviously that's a scam and I did that on purpose. I did that on purpose because one of the things that you need to know about is social engineering and scams and things like that. And you will find that 90% of computer hacks do not actually involve computers. They involve people um, tricking you, 
talking to you, gaining your trust, and then extracting information from you. Okay, we're going to have a look at that in the uh, in in the next bit. Okay, so um, uh, if someone tries to, <laughs> yeah, that's that's right, that's right. If someone tries to um, get you to write your password down, don't do it. If a teacher asks you to write your password down, don't do it. Doesn't matter who it is. Even if it's the head saying, write your password down, you say no. Okay? I would be ashamed of any of my students that willingly gave out their passwords regardless of who it was. Even if it was the cops. Even if it was Theresa May. Do not ever give your password out. No one has a right to that. OK, and if we need to access your areas, we can access your areas because just reset your password and access your areas. Boom. OK, so uh, you should never give out your passwords. Remember, uh, if you get an email from the bank or whatever companies you know you are signed up for, they will never ask for your passwords. Uh, what if it's literal God? There is no literal God. Um, there, I said it. May God strike me down if that's not true. That's what I thought. Right, okay, so just moving on uh, to um, let's have a look at system security and how not to get hacked. Even if it, yeah, okay, so hypothetically, even if God himself told me to write my password down, I wouldn't because if God is omniscient, he already knows my password. Okay, in fact, that is the plot point in Star Trek V. If you haven't watched Star Trek V, it's a terrible film. But there's a bit where um, God, or what is supposedly God, asks um, for a starship to take him beyond the, uh, the, the barrier at the centre of the galaxy, to which Captain Kirk says, uh, what does God need with a starship? And you know what? He had a point. Um, so anyway... Um, yeah, I, there's no need to watch Star Trek, really. Um, I, I, I wouldn't. Um, so, uh, <laughs> good. Here we go. Um, I say I wouldn't. I, I am a massive, <laughs> I am a massive Trekkie. That's how I know all of this stuff. But um, I mean, I grew up watching Star Trek. I, <laughs> Deep Space Nine's good. Don't watch Voyager. Um, Star Trek Discovery <sighs> it had potential, but you know. Um, I mean, Tilly, 100% on board with Tilly. She is great. Um, the rest of it, I, oh, I just couldn't. I just got bored. I just got bored. I prefer the Orville. Anyway, we're getting we're getting off track here. So let's have a look at this section here. Um, by the end of the lesson, you will be able to explain the term social engineering. I've just introduced you to a little bit of social engineering there, where I try to trick you into giving your um, into giving your passwords there. Okay. Um, so uh, we'll have a look at social engineering. Uh, discuss ways to make your computer systems more secure. Well, we've already discussed a few ways, so we'll go over a few more. Uh, and we'll look at what a strong password actually looks like now. There is what an actual strong password looks like, and there's what a strong password looks like in the eyes of OCR. Uh, so obviously you need to know the OCR version, but it would be remiss of me not to uh, explain the um, the real version as well. Um, so. Um, here's a question. Which part of any computer system is the most vulnerable to attack? Answer that question. Which part of any computer system is most vulnerable to attack? Put your answers in the chat. Human web page. Uh, it is the humans. It is the users. The users, the users are the weakest part of any computer system. Okay. Um, in fact, give me two seconds. Let me just find this um, uh, hilarious webcomic. Uh, let's find this. B -b 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 there we go. That is the one. Um, uh, now, hopefully, this will uh, display. Nope, I messed up. Come on, get it together, Carl. Uh, here we go. 
Bang. Bang. Okay, there we go. Uh, this is from Humorous Webcomic XKCD. Um, yeah, my keyboard is so loud because it's a mechanical keyboard. That's why it's so it's so amazing. Um, cost eighty quid. Now, you know, some people might say that's a waste of money. Probably right. Um, so, in the uh, in the crypto nerd's imagination, oh, his laptop's encrypted. Let's build a million dollar cluster to crack it. Oh, it's no good. Four thousand and ninety six bit RSA. Blast! Our evil plan is foiled. But what would actually happen is. Uh, Oh, his laptop's encrypted. Drug him and hit him with this five-dollar wrench until he tells us the password. Yep, I got it. It's it's remarkably easy to extract information from people, um, com especially compared to. Oh, that that wasn't my best voice acting. We'll we'll get on to my good voice acting later. Um, it's it's remarkably easy to uh, extract information from people um, compared to rem uh, extracting information from uh, the computer. Uh, now there is a very um, interesting book that you can read, which is called um, uh, which is called Cyberpunk, um, and I can't remember who it's by. Just give me two seconds. I'm just going to run upstairs and get it. Um, in fact, while I am doing that, uh, I've got a little video here. Uh, which has got an e example of social engineering, right? And so this is this is an example of something called vishing, which is voice solicitation. Okay, so this is phoning someone up and tricking them into um, uh, giving over details and stuff like that. Now, as you watch this video, um, just have a think about what tools and techniques Jess uses on this video to try and extract information from people. And again, I will put a link in the chat. I'll also put a link in the description once the video is up. Okay, so I'll run and get that book for you uh, and you can watch this. I invited Chris to hack me uh, with his team, um, but they're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and an internet connection. We help people with human security issues by testing vulnerabilities for, um, for like a network test, but it's for the people network. We test those vulnerabilities, see where the holes are, and then help people learn so they can patch them. Can we try some of this? Can we try some, Yeah. see I if think, it works? Yeah, we, we probably could uh, have our star visher here make some phone calls as <laughs> Let's we go do first. it. Sure, do you want to do a sample vishing call? What's vishing? Vishing is voice solicitation, and basically um, what you do is you use the phone to extract information or data points that can be used in a later attack. Let's do it. Will okay. you, who are you going to call? Maybe I'll call your cell phone provider okay. and see if I can get them to give me your email address. I, I bet they're good. I bet they have my back, <laughs> but yeah, go, go for it. I'm going to spoof from your number, so it's going to look like it's calling from you. Okay. Hi, I'm actually, I'm so sorry. Can you hear me okay? I, my baby, I'm sorry. <laughs> my, <laughs> my husband's like, we're about to apply for a loan and we just had a baby and he's like, get this done by today. So I'm so sorry, I can't I, um, call you back. <laughs> I'm trying to log into our account for uses information and I can't remember what email address we use to log the account. The baby's crying and, um, can, can you help me? Awesome. In just 30 seconds, Jessica gets my personal email address. Um, now, if I needed to um, add our older daughter on our account so she could call in and make changes, how would I need to go about doing that? You would have to send me a secure pin through a text message? Yeah, well, the thing is, I don't think I'll be able to receive a text message if I'm on the phone. Shh, shh, shh. Oh, I'm not on there either? I, so I thought when we got married, um, he added me to the account. Okay, my Jessica name. uses my girlfriend's name and a fake social security number 5127 to set up her own personal access to my account. Wait, I'm sorry, so there's no password on my account right now? Can I set that up? She even gets the support phone. person to change my password. Thank you so much for your help today. So she just no, basically no, blocked me out of my own account. I'll get her fed after this. <laughs> All right, thank you. Holy shit. So they they just gave they just gave you access to my entire cell phone account. You're gonna have to go on and change your password now because it's Jess, my name. And all it took was a crying baby and a phone call. Yes. I really thought that my cell phone company would protect me. I mean, like. 
Okay, so uh, so yeah, so you can see from that, um, just with a little bit of information, <laughs> just with a little bit of information uh, and uh, some decent acting skills and a little bit of stuff on the side, you can get some. Um, you you can you can do some uh, some pretty damaging stuff. Um, just um, I'll, I'll just post the um, uh, URL in the chat. Um, what you guys can do is if you can um, uh, if you could just have a quick discussion what what things did she do that allowed her to get uh, access to the thing and what information did she need to start off with was there anything she needed to do technology wise to get that stuff done Yes, all of this stuff. All of this stuff. Now, the um, using the computer for the baby sounds and playing on sympathy. Human beings generally are nice people. They want to help people out. And so when they hear a crying baby and when they hear a woman who's like really flustered and she wants to get this thing sorted, they want to they want to go the extra mile to help her out. And they don't realize they're being conned. Um, and so uh, it's... There was some information that she needed, though. She obviously needed the phone number of the person she was trying to hack so that she could spoof the uh, the number. Now, phone spoofing is something that's pretty easy to do. You can get dialers, which uh, you can use to, uh, to dial uh, a number, and you can set it to spoof so it looks like it's coming from another number. Okay, so, um, so that, that's fairly easy to do. Um, but um, really, the amount of technical knowledge that she needed was not that much. Uh, so this is the book that I was talking about. Okay, you see, it's called Cyberpunk: uh, Outlaws and Hackers on the Computer Frontier. Uh, this it's a pretty old book now, 1991. But there's some really interesting stuff in there uh, about people like Kevin Mitnick, who is widely regarded as the greatest hacker uh, there ever was. Um, uh, but it's interesting to see how so many of the hacks in this don't use computers. They just play on human emotions. In fact, one of the hacking team that was rolling with uh, Kevin Mitnick, the Roscoe gang in the, uh, at, the, at the time, she didn't have any computer knowledge whatsoever. This is what she used to do. She used to go to bars where military personnel hung out. She used to start drinking with military personnel she used to take them home and she'd have sex with them and get them to share all this information you know and then in the morning you know off she goes she knows she knows the information she can she can get that that information you know so i mean that's um maybe an extreme example but you know it, it's just showing you that um hacking is not necessarily just computer based now a lot of it is computer based right but a lot of um, a lot of the uh, the stuff um, that you need to get done comes from social engineering now how do you get can someone give me a suggestion on how if I wanted to find out information about uh, a specific person where might be the best place to start looking Yes, yeah, social media is a good place. Um, if you um, if you are on social media uh, and your um, profile is not set to private, anyone can see that information. You know, uh, if you're constantly posting pictures of yourself on Instagram, people have access to all sorts of photos which they can use to set up fake profiles in your name. It's happened to teachers at school. Okay. Um, so you've got to be super, super careful um, about the information that you put up on the internet. Okay. Um, now, it's relatively easy these days to um, set up a um, 
It's relatively easy to set up a, uh, a private profile on any of your social media, but you've got to be super duper careful uh, about who you add as a friend as well. Because if you um, if you add someone as a friend, they then have access to your profile, right? And so if someone comes along and uh, they send you a uh, a friend invite and they've got a photo of one of your friends, you know, um, then you might think, oh, cool, that's them, you know whoever it is that's Bob okay I'll add them yeah I mean obviously not having friends that's how I've managed to survive uh, life for this long uh, but you know I'm just saying uh, it is remarkably easy to build up a fake profile from various d different bits of information that lie scattered around the web and sometimes as well if you leave information on old websites and you don't come back to it it doesn't necessarily go away um, so so there you go in fact I mean I was tempted to just do some uh, searches for uh, various different um, uh, various different people that are in here uh, who is who is bro skits do you have a deviant art profile out of interest no okay maybe not I just searched for bro skits on the internet and I found uh, I found a deviant art profile with some some arts that's been uh, that's been drawn. I mean nothing nothing amazing, but you know what? If that's a uh, uh, if if that's you, then you know it it suggests that you know we can find you. It probably isn't, to be honest. I mean maybe it's just a, a made up name. But the thing is, like uh, if you have if you use a, a name. Uh, no, you don't need to know what deviant art is. It's it's a social media platform for sharing artwork, basically. Okay. So uh, yeah, I, I was just doing a quick check. I checked some of your usernames uh, just to see if I could find you uh, on the internet. Uh, I mean, if if you go if you go look in, you could probably find some stuff. All I'm saying is make sure that all of your um, profiles are locked down uh, if they if they need to be. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Yep, whole load of hentai. Uh, okay, so ba, 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 um, just uh, just to uh, show these, uh, people are weak. Basically, that's that's what you need to remember. People are weak, and that's why it's important to have these network policies that I talked about. Um, now, you don't need to know all of these different terms. You need to know this one. Okay, you need to know what what phishing is. Okay, it's worth knowing what the other ones are, just in case. Uh, but I have never seen a question specifically reference vishing, farming, or smishing. I have seen fishing quite a lot. Can someone tell me what fishing is? Uh, yep, fake email. Uh, what 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 does the fake email do? Uh, pretending to be a company. Now we're getting closer to it. Okay, so uh, yeah, it's all about emails um, here's an example of a phishing email okay so we've got this email from amazon.com but if you look closely it's from management at mazoncanada.ca not amazoncanada.ca okay so the email address that it's been sent from it looks like it's legit but it's not okay when you look closer it's not legitimate uh, another thing that you'll notice it says dear client We've sent you this email. Do you want me to read it out in a in a voice? <clears throat> uh, do you want me to do the voice? No. Yes. Uh, what what voice would you like? I can do British, uh, Deep South. Um, I'll do Deep South, shall I? Amazon.com. Dear client, we have sent you this email because we have strong reason to believe your account has been used by someone else. In order to prevent any fraudulent activity from occurring, we are required to open an investigation into this matter. Uh, we have locked your Amazon account and you have 36 hours to verify it or we will have the right to terminate it. To confirm your identity with us, uh, click the link below. Uh, and then there's that link. Uh, sincerely, the Amazon Associates team. Um, okay, so um, let's have a look at what's going on here. Dear client, right? if you receive an email from a company, they know who you are. 
right? And so they would not say, dear client, dear valued customer. No, they're not going to say that. They're going to say, for me, anyway, they're going to say, dear Mr. Smith or dear... K Smith or dear Mr. whatever fake name I've used to sign up, but they're not, they're never going to say dear um, dear client or dear valued customer. It's not going to happen, right? Okay, so um, I'll, I'll do New York for the next one. How's that sound? Yeah, um, and then another thing as well. If you look at this link. Um, when it, I mean, you look at that link and it looks legit, right? It's HTTPS. It's pointing at Amazon.com. That looks legitimate. But actually, it's easy, as you well know from your HTML programming, it's easy to have a link which looks like it's going to one place but actually directs you to a different place. So when you actually hover over the link, you can see it actually goes to HTTP colon slash slash redirect dot dot com. Okay, so you've got to be super careful about uh, the links that are in the uh, in, in the email. They, these are like obvious ways that you can tell uh, that it's it's not legit. Other ways you can tell that it's not legit is terrible, terrible grammar. Uh, I would wager if I had a look at some of my personal email now, uh, I'd have at least 10 spam messages from uh, supposed Nigerian princes saying that, um, you know, I've inherited several million pounds. Um, I also get ones from uh, from uh, Russian, supposedly Russian women uh, who want to find a nice, uh, want to find nice European men to settle down with. But um, uh, but you know the the grammar is always really awful and it's obviously not legit. Um, so um, I've never got a scam email. Well, I mean. Let's keep it that way. Um, you can avoid scam emails by uh, when you sign up to uh, different uh, like accounts and stuff like that. Use dump emails. Don't use your genuine email. I have about five different email addresses which I use for various different things. There's only one of them which I use for specific personal stuff. Uh, so I know if I get an email from that, it's probably from my dad because I think he's the only one that actually has it. Um, so, so there you go. Um, right, so I mean that's that's phishing. Obviously, the idea is when someone, when some poor sap clicks on this link because they think they need to update their details, um, they are redirected to a website which might look exactly like this, but it ends up harvesting their data. They type in their account details, and then boom, they've got your account details. It's another reason why you should never have the same password for more than one service, right? If I have the same password for Steam as I have for Origin, as I have for uh, my Gmail, as I have for everything else, if one of those gets hacked, then all of them are vulnerable. Okay, so you've got to make sure you have different passwords for, uh, for all of them. Okay, um, cool. Just moving quickly on here. Uh, Dear customer, your Apple ID is due to expire today. Please tap HTTP colon slash slash bit.do forward slash CRQB6 to update and prevent loss of services and data. Apple SMS stop to 43420. Okay, so this is an example. It's not phishing, it's smishing. It's the same thing, but it's obviously sending um, text messages rather than um, uh, rather than thingy uh, emails. I've never received a smishing message, but I know people who have. They always seem to be on iPhone for some reason. Um, so that's uh, that's that's interesting, isn't it? Um, but yeah, what have we got here? Um, so this is an interesting website that you can visit. Um, because iPhone ain't scared. Once your email has been harvested, uh, it'll be put on a list, which is then sold all over the black market. And once that email's been compromised, it, it's out there, okay? So you've got to make sure you change your passwords regularly. This is the reason. I mean, just because your email has been compromised once doesn't necessarily mean it's always going to be uh, bad. It means that you need to make sure you change your um, uh, your email. In fact, here's something that you can try. I've put the link to um, 
this website in the chat. If you have a click on there, type in your own email, uh, you can tell whether or not it has been um, harvested by a um, uh, like hackers and sold on the black market. Okay, so this is not me trying to scam you, by the way. This is me genuinely doing this. In fact, I will. I'll. I'll do it myself for you. Uh, uh, for you right now. So if I go to this, have I been uh, pwned .com, You can see here if I type in my email address, ka dot smith at warriner dot oxen dot sch dot uk. Uh, when I click on that, I can see. Look. Brilliant. My email has not been added to the to the list. I, this is not fake. This is 100% genuine. You don't have to do it if you don't want to. I just think it's pretty interesting. Okay, um, so uh, this is one way that you can find out whether or not uh, your email has been um, has been uh, compromised, has been breached. So uh, that's something for you to try. Uh, if you trust me, uh, which you really should trust me. I mean, this is a legit site. You can see down here. There's all of this stuff. So the idea is that it will it will tell you where the thing. Uh, yeah, use my warrant as a dump email. That's that's fair enough. Uh, right, where did we get up to then? Uh, system security. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to quickly run through this uh, these bits and bobs. Um, yeah, if it so like I said, if it if it does appear on the list, you can see um, like where those um, where those links where those leaks might have occurred. Now, it, if you have signed up for uh, uh, PlayStation Online or Xbox Live with that email, chances are it's on that list because they were compromised. Okay, now just because it's compromised, it doesn't necessarily mean it's at risk. But if you haven't changed your password in the past, like four years, or if you haven't changed your password since the breach occurred, then it might be worth just changing that password just to be on the safe side. Okay, um, so uh, we're not going to do this. Um, I will mention these things secure password okay a password now in the eyes of OCR a password is secure if it contains a mix of uppercase letters lowercase letters digits and symbols um, it is also uh, needs to be at least eight characters long okay so if it's at least eight characters long contains a mix of uppercase letters lowercase letters uh, digits and symbols in the eyes of OCR that is secure now technically yep that is pretty secure and it will it will be difficult for a computer to uh, uh, to crack and it will take a long time for a computer to brute, brute force it yeah OCR <laughs> example password one good um, but um, they're not always easy to remember like that. And actually, if you just take um, two words in English, separate them out and stick one word in the middle of the other one, that actually creates a more secure password, which is then easier for you to remember. Um, so we'll stick with the OCR uh, thing because that's, you know, obviously that's your exam you got to you got to sort of count out to their um, uh, to their views uh, so at least eight characters long um, a mix of capital letters lowercase letters and um, and symbols yeah so a dictionary attack a dictionary attack will not work um, on um, words that are made up of uh, multiple different um, words themselves because they don't appear in the dictionary if you choose a word that does appear in the dictionary then yeah a dictionary attack is going to crack it in seconds so that's why you should never choose a word that's just in the dictionary however you can choose multiple words that are in the dictionary and sandwich them together. As an example, right, if I have the word, uh, let's come up with two words, uh, let's say octopus and another one, uh, nettle, two totally different words, right? Uh, if I was to have either of those as a password, that would be weak AF fam. Uh, but if I take um, octopus and split it in the middle and then put the nettle in the middle of it, okay, um, Octonettlepus, that doesn't appear in the dictionary. That's actually more secure. You can make it even more secure, I guess, uh, by uh, putting uh, capital letters, Octonettlepus, uh, like that. So the start of each bit is a capital letter. You could also uh, substitute some of the, uh, the letters uh, for numbers. Uh, so we could have Octonettlepus. Uh, 
puss like that maybe or maybe replace that with a five okay but again the more of the these changes you make the less it less easy it is to remember um, one thing that you should never do is if you come up with a password like uh, octonetal puss for example and it says oh it needs to have numbers in it don't just put your date of birth in there your password should never contain any personal information because that stuff's too easy to find out okay yeah, most brute force programs will change letters for numbers. That's why it's not entirely secure. You know, it happens. So, um, uh, so there you go. Anyway, anyway. Um, but I mean, you guys, you guys obviously know how to create secure passwords. I'm not going to dwell on that. Two-factor authentication, though. How many of you have either a Steam account or an Origin account or some other account that uses two-factor authentication? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you know how two factor authentication works. What is two factor authentication? Basically, when you sign in uh, to a um, when you sign into any service, you need your username and you need your password. And once you've signed in, it will send out a message either to your email or directly to your mobile phone um, and then as in addition to the username and password, you need to also type in that message. Okay, so I've got an app on my phone, which I'm just going to open here, called uh, Authenticator. Uh, now you can see here. It doesn't matter that you can see these numbers that are appearing there because they change all the time, right? Uh, and they're only valid for about 30 seconds at a time. So you can see one of them is for my Ubisoft account, one of them is for my Humble Bundle account, one of them is for the Origin account. When I sign into those things, it will say, right, what's the code? Now that code is changing every 30 seconds, okay? And so if I try and sign in at any point with the username and password, uh, once it's changed, you know it won't be valid anymore. Which means that um, if someone's try, if someone has your username and they have your password, and they and try and sign in, but they don't have the second factor authentication device, they will not be able to sign in. Uh, and usually, you will get a message uh, from the service that said, "Yo, someone trying to sign in over here. It doesn't look like you because they're in Brazil." Uh, and then uh, they'll say, "Right, okay, we're gonna we're gonna update my 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 password." Uh, the app is called Google Authenticator, um, and uh, the way that it works is uh, it has to be tied to a specific service. Um, most places will use it or some variant of it. So, uh, but it doesn't have to be sent to the authenticator. It could also be um, sent. They could send a code to you via email, for instance. Okay, so that's what two-factor authentication is. Lock and key security, the most obvious and yet the most overlooked way of securing a computer, lock it up behind a door. Uh, when I leave C3, I try to lock it up every time I leave. Sometimes I will leave it open because I know I'm going back in there. But generally speaking, if your computer is locked away, then, you know, uh, when you say or a link, what do you mean by or a link? Because we've got to be careful here. It's very important to note the two-factor authentication, when you sign in, it, they will never give you a link to click on on the same machine that you sign in from. They might email you a link, but that's not the same thing. Yes, they'll send a link to you via email, which you then have to click on. Uh, but it's very important to note that you won't sign in and then, you know, they won't then give you a, a link that says, you know, click here or whatever. As long as you're clear that, they're, yeah, they're emailing that out to you. Um... um just a word on password reuse. Um, my password for Google is hash Applejack666. It isn't really, obviously. Don't try and log in with that because I made it up. Um, Google has super strong encryption and it never stores passwords in plain text because that's generally a bad idea. If you store passwords in plain text, it means if someone hacks your uh, server, they can access all of the, uh, the, the plain text stuff, right? Um, Google has super strong encryption, but other websites don't always have super strong encryption. Okay, 
my password for Bob's totally insecure online chat forum, which doesn't actually exist, obviously, is the same password. Bob doesn't take any security uh, precautions, okay? Based on that information, how safe is my bank account if I use online banking with Santander? On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is totally about to get owned and 10 is not even God could break in, how secure do you think my... Uh, my bank account is. <laughs> right. My bank account is not secure at all. It's my in fact my bank account is only as secure as Bob's totally insecure online chat forum. Uh because um if someone tries to hack Google, they're going to get nowhere, right? But if they hack um, Bob's totally insecure online chat forum, which is a pretty easy job for them to do, they then have details. If I've signed up with my Google uh, email and I've signed up with this password, well, now they know the first thing they're going to do is try that email account with that password. If they manage to get in, they then have access to everything. They will then be able to send an email to my bank saying oh, I've lost my password what can I do? Now I know that Santander is actually pretty secure and they will not send out password renewal uh, via email they will always post it out to me so I know the bank has got my back right? Um, but you know that's uh, that's generally um, you know it, it's it's not secure. If you If you reuse passwords it's generally pretty bad um, hey, are you still using Google? Yep, still using Google. Uh, Gmail's pretty damn good, and uh, Google Classroom is pretty damn good too. Um, in fact, all of these uh, presentations are on Google. Everything that you see, uh, except for uh, this lot here, uh, and uh, yeah, that's that's pretty much uh, a Google thing. Uh, now then. So hopefully password reuse all of that lot that you've got a better idea of that now. Um, so passwords should be changed regularly. Uh, I'm I'm going to leave this to you. There is a website that you can try. I probably wouldn't recommend typing in your actual password into this, uh, but you can if you want. Um, so uh, you can uh, you can try. You can try going to this website, typing in a password and seeing how long uh, it might take a brute force cracker uh, to uh, to crack uh, the password. Um, my... Yeah, okay, so it the, the alignment's a little bit off, so uh, probably not going to be able to... Can I zoom in? If I put happy, it's cracked instantly. If I put happy lol, it takes five seconds. However, if I put, um, what was that one? Hashtag Apple Jack 666. Three million years? I mean, that's, I don't mind it if it takes three million years to, uh, to crack. Let's put the octonettle puss one in there. Octonettle uh, puss. Two years? I mean, two years of solid processing to crack it. That's just all with lowercase. If I just change these to uppercase, uh, just changing a single letter to uppercase changes that to 6,000 years. O, C, T, O, that would be an N there. 16,000 years. N, E, T, T, L, E, uh, that's going to be a P. Uh, still on 16,000 years. If I now put a 666 on the end of it, it changes it to 38 billion years. And if I uh, put a symbol in there, let's put the not symbol in there. Uh, 14 quintillion years. Um, so you can see how, I mean, this is based on like brute force crackers and, uh, and, and stuff like that. Um, so there you go, there. Um, so obviously change your password regularly make sure your password is uh, secure uh, oh look there's that same thing again I already had it down there we'll skip over that uh, not gonna do that um, so just remind me um, yeah, why not create even stronger passwords uh, where is the weak spot in all computer systems Yes, the human, 
the operator, the person using the machine. Uh, how frequently should you change your password? Uh, three seconds is probably too frequently. Yeah, yeah. I mean, every month, every three to four months, yeah. Uh, you should definitely, every new account you make should definitely have a different password. But even those individual passwords, you should change them uh, probably every month or at least every couple of months you should change that, uh, change that password. Um, so there you go. And finally, why should you never use the same password for all online services? If one account is hacked, yeah, you get access to all of them. Yeah, okay. Find one, you've got them all. Uh, <laughs> um, maybe rather than spending your whole life changing your passwords, maybe you should just consider how many different services you're actually signed up to and consider whether you actually need to sign up to those services. Um, I mean, there's a lot of... I'm not on any social media because I see it as a complete and utter waste of time. Um, but... Um, just, I mean, there's a lot of websites that I'm able to sign into just using my Google account. So, you know, that's that's something to uh, to consider there. Uh, are there apps that create strong passwords for you? Yes, uh, but would you trust any app which is generating a password for you to not be also storing that password and logging it against your IP address? I probably wouldn't. Um, you can write an app to generate a a strong password. It's pretty easy to do in uh, in in Python. Uh, but I'll leave that to you. Um, cool. Just want to quickly go over some malware stuff then. Um, oh, you mentioned a VPN. Uh, what's a? What does VPN stand for? And what? It, why is it good? Yes, it's a virtual private network. Um, it does more than just change your IP address, okay? So um, it it kind of masks your IP address, but it's basically a giant proxy. So um, it it uses the internet, but you're effectively on your own enclosed network. So when you access a web page, what happens is you access the server on your VPN, and that server accesses the web page on your behalf and then sends it back, hiding your IP address uh, from uh, from from the uh, from the outside net and then uh, any data that you send there is encrypted as well um, so uh, so there's that extra layer of security okay um, so let's just have a look at um, the uh, malware uh, we should be able to blast through this what is malware malware doesn't look like that but that's a uh, I think I just did a Google search for malware uh, yes, that is why VPNs are... Well, they're not necessarily slow, but they're definitely slower than a, a direct connection to the internet. Okay. Uh, encrypted tunnel is a good way of, uh, of, 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 of mentioning it. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's not a bad description. So, what is malware? Naughty software. Uh, did you pirate that stuff? I just did... I, I did a Google search. Um, the... Copyright Designs and Patents Act states that you're allowed to use uh, copyrighted images for the purposes of education. Um, does this fall under that category? Maybe. I'll wait for someone to sue me. Um, so anyway, um, malware. From the French meaning bad. Uh, and where? The second half of software. Actually, the mal is probably more like the first half of malicious, uh, but the mal in malicious comes from French meaning bad. So yeah, it's just, it's nasty software. It's bad software. It's software specifically designed to cause damage to a computer system, right? And you need to know about malware. You need to know about some of the different types of malware. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. The ones that you need to know about are viruses, trojans, worms, and ransomware. Do you know what Trojans, viruses, worms and ransomware are? Do you know what the differences are between them? Uh, on a scale of 1 to 5, how confident are you that you could explain the differences between them? Uh, 
Be more specific, Callum. Yes, a Trojan pretends to be something else. What specifically does it pretend to be? Yes. Okay, right. I'm going to cover these in the order that they appear. Uh, yes, horse. Good. Uh, please do not write horse on your uh, answer paper. Uh, viruses. Uh, viruses are programs that self-replicate. Okay, they self-replicate and they spread um, from from system to system. Um, although generally speaking, a virus is any program that self-replicates. It usually has a harmful payload as well. It will usually copy itself and then try and do some damage. Okay. Um, now, the thing with a virus is that it's um, it will sort of like automate itself to some extent you download a virus you run that virus oh no now your files are infected the next time you access those files they're gonna self-replicate again next time someone else accesses those files the virus is gonna then spread to their system does that make sense um, so if you have an infected file and you give that file to someone else they will then use that file and it will infect their system as, as well okay so um, it's a virus is separate from these other things okay so uh, usually usually uh, the virus will have some sort of um, uh, dangerous payload uh, so it will either delete files or it'll overwrite files or, or something like that okay now a Trojan a Trojan is not the same thing a lot of people lump them into the same category because they're all they all fund, fall under the category of malware a Trojan will disguise itself as a legitimate program okay and when you try and run that program it will do something nasty now normally what a Trojan does it won't actually cause any damage and it usually doesn't do anything really noticeable but what it's likely to do is set up a backdoor to your system that hackers can then access or it will set up a keylogger on your system and then send that data out to the hackers uh, or it might add your um, system uh, to what's called a botnet which we'll have a look at a little bit later on when we talk about DDoS attacks okay so Trojan is any um, malware which masquerades as a uh, piece of legitimate software now a worm is kind of similar to a virus in the sense that it's self-replicating right but usually a worm it will be triggered by someone in the first place okay so they'll say right I've created this worm now to set my worm loose on the internet and what happens is the worm will copy itself and it will eat up existing system resources until it there's no more space on that computer and then it will spread across to any other computers that connected on the network okay now it might the worm might just uh, use up active CPU time which can uh, obviously grind your computer to a halt it might self replicate itself on your storage device uh, it might use up all available RAM it might use up all of your available hard disk space it might be a combination of all of those but the point is someone sets it going and then it self replicates over and over and over again and spreads to any systems that are connected okay so it's similar to a virus but it doesn't necessarily have a destructive payload okay yes it snowballs if you've ever heard the term fork bomb that's that's the type of thing that we'll talk about and ransomware as someone mentioned yes as angel mentioned ransomware uh, is um, a piece of software it usually gets delivered in the form of a Trojan and what it will do is encrypt all of your data and then it will pop up a message saying <laughs> your data is encrypted uh, and then in order to decrypt your uh, your data you have to pay a certain amount of money to the hackers usually in Bitcoin um, and then they will either decrypt your uh, data or they will probably more than likely just ask for more money um, Generally speaking, uh, they use such good encryption methods, it's not possible to decrypt without without them uh, doing it. Um, and uh, I, um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's anyone that's actually had their data decrypted by actually paying this stuff. There might be, I might be wrong, uh, but I would not trust these guys uh, to, to actually decrypt my data. Uh, so your best bet is to completely delete everything on your computer, format your hard disk, reinstall your operating system, and restore your files from a backup, which you keep regular backups, right? Yes, that's right. 
Um, go back over Trojan and Worm. Uh, so the Trojan is any malware which masquerades as legitimate software. And then once it's been deployed, it will do things like install a backdoor or it will... Um, uh, allow uh, hacker access, install a keylogger or something like that. The worm is a self-replicating program which is set off by the creator uh, and then uh, will use up uh, empty system cycles and spread from system to system. If you need to go over that again, you can rewind the stream or you can you know, wait until we're done and then you can go back and, and revisit it. Okay. Uh, there are services to recover data. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but services to recover data that's usually if you've got damaged hard disks and recovering the data which is in an unencrypted form on those damaged hard disks as opposed to breaking the uh, encryption which is usually impossible now then now then that i mean that's malware uh, obviously the way to protect against malware well someone tell me how do, how do i protect against malware Um, firewall won't necessarily protect against all malware. Um, definitely an antivirus. Antivirus is your sort of one-stop shop for preventing viruses, trojans, and worms, and sometimes ransomware. Um, yeah, disconnecting your machine from the internet might prevent it, but viruses can still proliferate through USB sticks and things like that. Okay, any anti-malware software is what you're going for. Uh, a firewall is, it's not designed to protect against malware, it's designed to protect against like uh, intrusive attacks by hackers. So the firewall is not really the thing that's going to protect you from this lot. The antivirus is what's going to protect you from this lot. Definitely, definitely, regular backups will allow you to restore any lost data. So that's not protecting you from the cause of the, uh, of the damage, but it's allowing you to uh, limit the uh, the extent of the damage uh, with with regular backups there the other thing as well is just being savvy uh, if you are um, if you if you receive a phishing email don't click the link uh, if you are going to a dodgy website um, you know get out of there if you yeah, uh, don't browse unencrypted uh, make sure that your website is using HTTPS uh, if you go to a website um, and uh, it's offering you uh, free copies of expensive software chances are they're not legitimate and you're probably going to get a virus um, don't download filth off the internet um, it's probably going to be infected with viruses you know sound like a computer version of my mum I'm just telling you how to stay safe online and how to not ruin your computer the thing is I tell this to all of my family members and they completely ignore it and then I have to go around and fix their computers uh, and every single time I say don't go to those websites don't click on this don't install that make sure you run this antivirus software that I'm installing and um, and, and and they just sort of like say yeah 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 I'll definitely do that and then they definitely don't um, so that's it's pretty annoying it's kind of like if you took a broken car to a mechanic uh, you know you you driven your car into a, a wall and the front was all crumpled in you took it to the mechanic and you said oh man I drove it into the wall and this is all, all knackered and the mechanic spends all day fixing your car and he's like right I finally managed to fix it all what I recommend you do is do not ever drive into a wall and you're like yeah 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 no worries man and then as soon as you leave the garage you drive straight into a wall you know that's that's kind of what it's like but anyway I'm, I'm having a bit of a rant hello Luke Imagine having to download more stuff off the internet to get rid of stuff you got from downloading things off the internet. Yeah, I mean, well, that's the the point is having making sure you've got the protections in place before you go downloading stuff uh, off the internet. Okay, so uh, just moving on to, I mean, malware, viruses. Those are one thing that you need to know about, but there are other forms of attack that you also need to know about, okay? Um, data interception. Denial of service, also known as a DOS attack, or uh, a DDoS is a variant of that. SQL injection and brute force attacks. Now, you need to know a little bit about this. You don't need to know all of this in any great amount of depth, okay? Um, so, uh, let's just... Uh, Oh, what's going on here? Let's just go back to here. So, data interception. Uh, data interception is sometimes known as a man-in-the-middle attack. 
If one person, in this case Alice, is transmitting some data to another person, in this case Bob, if someone in the middle, in this case Mallory, is able to intercept that data, not only are they able to read all of the data, but they are able to modify the data and then pass it on and the recipient will be unaware of that. Okay, so Alice sends some data uh, to Bob, but Mallory's in the middle. And what Mallory does is like, oh, you know what? I'm going to change that data now, uh, and I'm going to I'm going to change it to something totally different. So maybe Alice is going to say, oh, hi Bob. Uh, here's the uh, uh, here's the password for um, our files. Um, just double check that it works. And Mallory intercepts that message and says, oh, hi Bob. Um, uh, I, I can't remember the password for our files. Can you uh, can you send me the password? Bob sends that message back. Oh, here's the password, Alice. Mallory then sends a message on to uh, Alice saying, uh, "Oh, everything's good in the hood. Uh, you know, we're all we're all fine." Okay. There's more to it than just that, but this 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 is something that um, that can happen. You can execute your own man in the middle attack, which would be a violation of the Computer Misuse Act. Um, but just to let you know how easy it is to do, if you go to a coffee shop and you sit and you make your phone a uh, a Wi-Fi hotspot and you give it the same name as the coffee shop hotspot, lots of people will connect to your Wi-Fi hotspot rather than the coffee shop's one, and any data Data that they send unencrypted you will be able to view okay and so it's very easy to mount a man in the middle attack uh, just by exploiting people's naivety like that but like I said it's illegal uh, and it's a bad idea so don't do it um, next up I've got this question how can we how do you think we can protect against data interception and I've got a clue here this is a big clue Uh, n not the the pineapple. Yep, use use bad handwriting. Um, are you familiar with digital signatures? Okay. Now, uh, encryption won't always protect against a man in the middle attack. Um, if the uh, if the man in the middle is able to intercept the encrypted message and send uh, their own encrypted message to uh, the recipient saying hey give me that information you know they will you know say it, encryption doesn't always encryption is a good start definitely right but using what's called digital signatures is a uh, is, is a good idea so a digital signature uses some fancy maths uh, to ensure that the message that has been sent comes from that person and only that person Okay, you don't need to know the ins and outs of how it works. Um, but you know when you um, access a web page, in fact, if you're on YouTube right now, it should be HTTPS. If you click on the little um, uh, padlock in the top left corner, um, you should get uh, some information on the site. If you click on uh, the bit about the uh, the connection you should be able to uh, view the site security information you should be able to get information about the um, identity of the website and the certificate um, so that's a way of validating uh, whether the uh, the person is who they say they are or not okay uh, yeah I probably probably block the, uh, uh, the those, those cookies uh, I've got some uh, because you're being tracked all the time. I've got some uh, some add-ons for my uh, Firefox which will block uh, those those cookies and prevent them from uh, from from existing. Um, so uh, it's not just evil Google spying; it's evil everyone spying. Uh, I can I can give you some links on how you can you can like block a lot of those uh, those unnecessary tracking cookies. Um, so anyway, uh, digital signatures are a way that we can protect against data interception. Um, right, denial of service attacks, um, also known as a DOS attack. Uh, that's 
capital D, lowercase o, capital S to uh, distinguish it from DOS, the operating system. Uh, okay, so denial of service uh, attack. This is where you flood a server with so many requests that it buckles under the pressure. Okay, so you set up a script which constantly sends out requests to a website. It says, go to this website, go to this website, go to this website, go to this website a billion times a second or something like that as, as fast as you can. And the... Um, uh, the server that's receiving those messages, it's trying to process all of those requests so, so many times uh, that it just falls over. Okay, so I will explain the difference between a standard denial of service attack and a DDoS attack, which is a distributed denial of service attack. Now, Blessed has just raised a brilliant point down there. Uh, it doesn't happen if you comment on Reddit more than one in like 30 seconds. Yes, that is what is known as. Flood defense. Okay, if you have a flood defense, it means that if you receive the same um, request from the same IP address, or if you just receive multiple requests from the same IP address in a short space of time, it will say, right, block all requests from that IP address for a, for an amount of time. Okay, that's why. Um, the uh, yeah, I mean, it sometimes it is known as a floodgate. Um, that, that's why uh, when you post on Reddit, uh, you'll get a message that says, you're doing that too often. Uh, you know, and then it'll say, uh, so wait. Uh, Oi, I'll spell defense however the hell I'd like. Yeah, there we go. Um, but thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, flood defense. Um, you know what? No, it's called a flood game. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, so how do we get round those flood defences? Well, we use what's called a distributed denial of service attack. The flood defence doesn't work if those different requests are coming from different IP addresses. And so this is what a distributed denial of service attack is. Okay, so the attack, instead of coming from a single machine, it comes simultaneously from what's known as a botnet. A botnet is a number of machines that have been infected with uh, some malware which turns them into effectively zombie machines. So when the hacker gives the command, all of the machines that are infected um, will then start sending out packets to the target. Okay, And because they're coming from not just hundreds and thousands of requests a second, but they're coming from like hundreds of thousands of different machines at the same time, it becomes um, uh, impossible for the, uh, for the server to cope. Okay, here's a little map. Look, we can see Mr. Hacker here uh, is connected to these machines. All of these machines are in the botnet. When the hacker gives the command, he sends out the command to these machines. They send out the command to all of the other machines that are infected in the botnet. And all of the machines start sending requests to the server. The server can't cope and the server will, um, the, the server will buckle under pressure. Okay, so... You, what, the only way that you can protect against this is by using some sort of defense which is going to not only limit the uh, number of uh, requests, but you can use, as Solomon suggested down here, if you have um, IP address filtering or MAC address filtering, if you detect that a specific IP address is sending lots and lots of packets at once, you block that IP address. And you do that for every single IP address you can. Okay, And so the stronger... Uh, uh, your defenses are the more of those IP addresses you'll be able to block and so the less successful the DDoS is going to be okay but sometimes DDoS attacks are unintentional on Black Friday uh, when everyone is consumed by lust for um, like capitalism uh, which seems nonsensical to me uh, they all try and log into websites so they can get a cheap deal on some useless product which they never wanted in the first place but they perceive it to be a good deal because it's reduced in price by some amount you get hundreds of thousands of people trying to log on to the websites at the same time and they buckle under the pressure Okay, so yeah, uh, adamandeve.com got DDoSed on Valentine's Day. Yeah, so uh, everyone's trying to access it uh, because for some reason people think that if you don't buy your loved one something on Valentine's Day, you're the worst person in the world. Whereas what you really should be doing is treating them with love and respect on every single day of the year, not just one token gesture on the 28th of February, no, the 14th of February or whenever it is. There we go. Yeah, hashtag stay single. Um, anyway. 
Um, let's just uh, move on. Um, so I've said how... Look, I've even got a little picture of flood defences here. Um, I'm just going to go to adamandeve.com. There's some interesting products on this site, isn't there? Yeah. Top five. Yeah, good. Right, okay. That's 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 enough of that. Um, anyway. Next up. Um, so, SQL injection. You guys should all know about SQL. Right. The only SQL statement that you need to know is select. So something like select um, star from uh, users where um, name equals uh, Bob, for instance, something like that. OK, um, that's the only SQL command that you need to know. However, you do need to know about what a SQL injection attack is. Right. Lots and lots and lots of websites, I don't have exact figures, but I would say that most websites these days uh, run on a database backend. All of the data is stored in a database. <laughs> All, uh, the, uh, the, the stuff is stored in a database uh, and the website will pull the stuff up. Okay, that's why sometimes, even if you look on YouTube, uh, if you look at the URL, uh, it says something like uh, youtube.com forward slash uh, video equals yada yada yada, like, you know, it's got, it's got some in it, information like that, right? That's what's known as a request variable. And we often use those to pull information out of a database. Now, when you type information into a um, uh, a form, um, if you inject a SQL command into that form, there's a chance that the um, the back end will actually end up running the SQL command rather than storing your data. Can I play you some guitar? Yeah, okay, maybe. Okay, so. If you, um, instead of typing in your name uh, into a, uh, a form, if, if you typed in something like this, um, if you typed in something like that, um, what this would do is that that semicolon there effectively ends the uh, where the string would end okay so where normally the code would sort of take that information and uh, and execute a command based on that information what we're actually doing here is we're sort of tricking the system into running our code instead okay so it will this or one equals one that means it's just going to always I mean one always equals one, right? So it's going to try and do a thing, uh, and it's going to do that thing regardless, and then it's going to move on to execute this next command: drop table users, which is going to delete the, um, uh, which is going to delete the users table. The two dashes are a are a comment. Now you don't need to know the ins and outs of SQL injection. All you need to know is that SQL injection is where you enter SQL code into uh, the text entry boxes on a website and a, uh, a unsecure website will run that code which will allow you to gain access to the database uh, and uh, yes there is indeed a uh, comic about this there's another XKCD okay um, so here we go hi uh, do you want me to do it in a voice again um, Oh hi! This is your son's. No, no, that's not her talking, is it? That's the uh, that's the thing. Uh, so, uh, uh, good day. Uh, this is your uh, this is your son's school. We're having some uh, computer trouble. Oh dear! Did he break something? Uh, in a way. Uh, uh, did you really name your son Robert? Uh, apostrophe close brackets semicolon drop table student semicolon dash dash. 
Oh, yes! Little Bobby Tables, we call him! Uh, well, uh, we've, uh, we've lost this year's student records. I, uh, I hope you're happy. And I hope you've learned to sanitise your database inputs! Okay, yeah, it is a pretty great beard, isn't it? There we go. Uh, okay, so the idea is that you can see that he has entered his name as Robert, close uh, semicolon, close brackets, uh, semicolon, right? Uh, what that's done is that's ended the string there. I'm pointing at the screen here, and you can't see where my finger's pointing. Um, and uh, then it's executed the drop table command there, okay? So, like I said, you don't need to know the ins and outs of SQL injection. All you need to know is that... If someone types in a SQL command into the text box, um, there's a chance that that code could be executed if the uh, inputs are not properly sanitized. Okay. The final thing is brute force attacks. A brute force attack is where you exhaustively go through every single possible combination of characters to try and guess a password okay so for instance i might see right is the password a no is the password b no is the password c and so on and so forth c d e f g all the way all the way up to z if we got to the point where we've checked every single letter in the alphabet we then start again but now we add an extra letter is the password a a no. Is the password AB? Is the password AC? And so on and so forth until we get all the way up to ZZ. And then we go all the way back to the beginning. Is the password AAA? And so on and so forth. Right? Now that differs from a dictionary attack because all a dictionary attack does, it has a list of predetermined words and it will check to see all of those words. So basically if you have a list of every single word in the English language, it'll say, right, is the, uh, is the word ard aardvark? Is the word aardwolf? Is the word avocado? And it will go through all of that stuff, okay? Whereas a brute force attack um, exhaustively tries out lots of different combinations. Now, dictionary attacks um, are not necessarily guaranteed to find a, um, uh, a password, okay? But if they do find a password, they generally operate very quickly. Brute force attacks, given enough time, are guaranteed to find uh, the password as long as your, uh, your list of characters is, is accurate. However, they can take a long, long time. I mean, we saw like, you know, several million years. Uh, in fact, uh, if you've got a strong enough password, um, it, a brute force will take longer than the universe has left to exist, uh, uh, which, is, which is pretty bad. Um, uh, yes, one way to prevent brute force um, uh, attacks is to uh, prevent, you know, to lock out an account after uh, one or two password attempts. So that's one method of improving security against brute force attacks. Uh, we don't need to know dictionary attacks, do we? Um, you should probably know dictionary attacks. Yes, good old inevitable heat death of the universe. Uh, okay, uh, look, <laughs> how can we protect against brute force attacks? I mean, uh, as, um, as Mark mentioned um, we can protect against brute force attacks by uh, locking out an account if multiple uh, failed attempts have happened uh, in a short space of time. Um, the um, other way that we can do it is by making sure that we use a good like number of different combinations so instead of just lowercase letters we have lowercase and uppercase letters and numbers and symbols. Okay. How do I make a brute force attack for the school's Wi-Fi? You will have to write a program that goes through it. Uh, if uh, I can, I can give you some instructions on how to write a brute force uh, uh, program. But bearing in mind, uh, unless you are using it to crack something uh, which I have specifically given you instructions to do, you will be in violation of the uh, Computer Misuse Act. Um. Uh, well, it depends on it. the the length of time that it would take would depend on how uh, secure the password is, and uh, not all the passwords are amazingly secure. But anyway, let's uh, moving swiftly on. Um, that is pretty much it for um, system security. Um, yeah, you, I mean you can brute force any system. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how it. If there's a if there's a password to be had, which is made up of a combination of different letters, yeah, you can brute force it. You know. 
so anyway, um, so any questions on system security? I pre we we've spent. Uh, almost two hours on system security now, um, but no one complained uh, while we were doing it. Uh, so I'm assuming that this was all useful stuff. Um, I do have a separate video on system architecture, uh, which is available on the channel, uh, which will literally explain everything you have to do. But we can have some uh, we can have some uh, some quick questions on that. But if you're happy with system security, we can move on to uh, we can move on to something else. Uh, yeah, good good joke, Charlie. Um, that's uh, hilarious. Yeah. Uh, what? So I while you decide, I mean. So we've, we've, we've pretty much covered system security now. Um, networks I covered extensively in the previous stream, so uh, you can watch on there to, uh, uh, to, to catch up. Okay. Uh, if you need to, uh, um, if you missed the first part of this stream, you're going to have to wait and go back. I'm not recapping stuff that we've already done in the stream. Um, so we've got ethical and legal um, systems architecture. As I said, we've got I've already got a video on systems architecture, so I feel it's probably going to be more useful to look at either the ethical or legal things. So, um, is there anything in it specifically that you want to go over? Right, rather than just saying ethics and laws, can you think of anything specifically about those things that you want me to cover? Why the island shouldn't get Wi-Fi, right? We're not going to dwell on that question because that's a nonsense question. Uh, can we go back over all the laws? Yeah, that stupid island. We all know that island well. OCR island. They only have access to OCR supermarket. Um, right, so you want to go over some, some legal stuff, right? Give me two secs. Um, That was an amazing tune that I just made up. Hope you um, hope you like that tune. Uh, let's just go to. Oh, I've logged into the wrong, <laughs> totally the wrong account. Um, seems my old school is in violation of the Data Protection Act. There. Um, Right, what do we got here? I was going to legal. Boom, that's uh that's not what I wanted. Uh right, let me just find this for you. Oppressive communist regime. Yep. Yeah, ten. Uh, I can't actually find my. Ah, there we go. That's the one that I wanted. Uh, no. God, I can't. I've lost the ability to copy and paste. How rubbish am I? There we go. Okay, so uh, computer science and the law. Um, I mean, you should <laughs> you should probably eat. Uh, do we need to go over what happens to e-waste? You'll need to know all of that stuff. Yeah, uh, just so because. Any question like that is going to appear in an essay thing, um, right? Let's just have a uh, let's just have a a quick look at this. Um, 
so yeah okay i mean it's we're we're probably going to have to wrap this up fairly uh, soon anyway but let's just have a, a quick look at the law um there are four acts of law that you need to know about okay the computer misuse act uh the data protection act the copyrights designs and patents act and the freedom of information act uh Dark Souls Law. What's that? Get good or go to jail. Um, okay, so uh, why is Mark going to... That was a joke. Uh, I There was a reason for it. I think we, uh, when I produced the, uh, um, uh, the thing, I think we'd been talking about downloading movies or something. I can't actually remember. Um, but regardless, it doesn't matter. It was a, it was a joke. I meant no harm by it. In fact, I could change that to um, there. You go. How's that? Why you're all probably going to jail? All right. Um, next up. Describe the, uh, yeah, so we'll have a look at these different acts of law. We will have a look at the principles and punishments. Uh, I've got a few case studies, which we have been through before, uh, but we can we can go through them again. Okay, so, um, someone tell me what the Computer Misuse Act is all about. What is the purpose of the Computer Misuse Act? Uh, nope, that is not covered by uh, the Computer Misuse Act. Uh, using a computer without permission. Yeah, not logging onto people's devices. Prevents the unauthorized use of computers. Don't use someone else's computer for stuff. Uh, using a computer for harm. Right, so let's just... Um, you're all right to some extent, but let's just clear this up. Okay, so the Computer Misuse Act expressly forbids the unauthorized access of a computer system. There's two layers of it. The first level is accessing a, co a computer system without authorization. The second level is accessing a computer system without authorization with intent to cause harm. Okay, so you will be in violation of the Computer Misuse Act even if you don't cause any damage even if you didn't intend to cause any damage. Which means, if your friend leaves themselves logged in to Facebook or Twitter or whatever social media and you hop onto their account and you post a hilarious message uh, about how they're, um, you know, I don't know, something degrading about them, as people do, that means you are in violation of the Computer Misuse Act. Okay, now that sounds silly, right? But that's that's the letter of the law. Um, usually, it's a case of if you are hacking into a computer system. Um, now, bear in mind, if you're reading files, that's not destructive. If you are deleting files, even if you create a backup of them, that is destructive. If you copy files, technically that is destructive okay if you're moving stuff around if you're making any changes to the file system that is considered uh, harmful okay now the problem is it's actually pretty difficult to prosecute anyone under the computer misuse act can anyone suggest why it's difficult to prosecute anyone under the computer misuse act Bingo. It is difficult to gather any evidence. No, not because everyone does it. If everyone does it and, and they have evidence for it, everyone's going to jail. That's, that's not how the law works, right? It's the fact that it's difficult to prove who was doing it. It's also very difficult to prove what the intent of someone uh, is as well. Okay, so... 
uh, lack of evidence as to who was using any computer system at any given time. Um, if you are hacking from a um, uh, an internet cafe, for instance, they'll have the IP address of the internet cafe, but they don't necessarily know who it is that was using that computer. Okay, so it's difficult to um, it's difficult to convict anyone under the Computer Misuse Act. Nevertheless, it still carries uh, some fairly harsh penalties. In fact, if there is Wikipedia generally um, has some decent pages about this um, Computer Misuse Act. Let's see what Wikipedia has to say about it. Computer Misuse Act 1990. Um, the, does it actually mention? Yeah, so there's three layers here listed. Uh, Unauthorized access to computer material is punishable by 12 months imprisonment and or a fine not exceeding level 5 on the standard scale. Level 5 on the standard scale is unlimited. Okay. Now that doesn't mean that you can be fined unlimited pounds. It means that there is no upper limit to which the judge can set the fine. Okay. So unauthorized access to a to a computer, even if you don't do any damage or even if you do not intend to cause any damage, can be punishable by 12 months in jail and an unlimited fine. Okay. Um, level 2, unauthorized access with intent to commit or facilitate commission of further offences. Okay, that means if you access a computer system and you set up um, some way of making it easier for you to access the computer system later, so setting up your own user account or maybe changing the username so that you can get into it, that's punishable by 12 months in jail and a uh, maximum fine. Uh, maximum fine? On some and and or five years and fine on, on indictment. So uh, if you are uh, if you're convicted, you can get up to twelve months. If you're indicted, uh, you can get up to five years. I am not a legal expert. I don't really know the difference between um, conviction and indictment. Okay, so there you go. And level three, unauthorized modification of computer material. So this is where you've logged on and you've actually changed stuff. Okay, this is the uh, this is the most uh, punishing one. Uh, 12 months and uh, and an unlimited fine on conviction and 10 years uh, and an unlimited fine on indictment okay so level one uh, you, you're you're looking at 12 months uh, and an unlimited fine uh, level two you're looking at a maximum of five years and an unlimited fine and level three you're looking at 10 years and a, uh, and a uh, uh, an unlimited fine okay so that's um, that seems pretty harsh, but uh, isn't it making it easier for yourself to get into the computer changing stuff? Uh, potentially, yes. So, yeah, like I said, I'm not a lawyer. I don't know what the distinction is between those two things. Okay. Uh, of, <laughs> of course, Callum knows. I should uh, I should trust the budding young cop. Um, so the. Um, yeah, the fine goes up per instance of the crime as well, um, and that's worth noting, especially for the uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act. We'll have a look at that in a sec. Uh, so, Data Protection Act. What is the what's the point of the Data Protection Act? Someone tell me. We've already mentioned it once tonight, but someone let me know. Uh, yep, yeah, that's that's part of it. It's all about protecting data. It's about storing data safely. There is other bits to it as well, though. Yes, you're not allowed to uh, sell that data on. People who sign up uh, uh, and uh, give their personal data o over have a right to view what data is being held. Okay. Um, so let's just let's just go over this, okay? Um, so one of the things that the Data Protection Act um, covers is, like we said, any company which is storing data about people has to make sure that that data is stored safely, okay? So they have to make sure that they take adequate steps to make sure that other people don't gain access to that data. Another thing as well. 
the company is not allowed to hold data for longer than is necessary right if you sign up for um, some I don't know uh, political campaign which lasts for a year after that year they no longer need your data and they have to delete it okay so the data is only you only hold data for as long as it is necessary you can only keep data for the purpose that it was originally gathered okay if I collect your data because I'm doing a survey to find out uh, how many of you uh, think it's a good idea to um, uh, kite through the mega spiders, for instance, um, I am then not allowed to keep that data and use it for another purpose, say, uh, how many people um, like play video games in Banbury or something like that okay I'm not allowed to do that I have to use the data for the purpose it was originally gathered and then if I need it for something else I have to regather that data okay um, the other thing as well uh, that the um, uh, the Data Protection Act says is that data must be processed fairly and legally I mean that seems a no-brainer, right? But it's worth remembering, okay? So your data has to be processed legally. You can't, it can't be used for anything illegal, okay? So people aren't allowed to use your data to rig elections, for instance, okay? Um, now, with all of the updates to the Data Protection Act recently, um, it's unlikely, I think, that you will get a question on the Data Protection Act specifically. But you may still get a question which is about uh, data protection laws in general, because most data protection laws uh, abide by the same tenets. Okay, so things to bear in mind. You need to make sure that um, you are aware of the basic principles okay so personal data must be processed fairly and lawfully right um, and uh, it needs to be obtained only for the purpose that it was originally uh, you know it needs to be a, have a specific purpose so I'm I can't just hey can I have your data just in case I need it no it has to be a case of can I have your data because I need your data if you want to access this particular service okay um, so um, uh, it also has to be relevant so if I was collecting information about um, uh, people in year 11 that think that kiting the through the mega spiders is a good idea uh, I don't need to know your address for that so I wouldn't be able to gather that information I'd probably just have to gather your name um, year group perhaps uh, and uh, whether you think it's a good idea or not okay I'm not allowed to gather extra information which is not relevant to the information at hand okay uh, the information needs to be accurate if I gather your data and use it for a specific purpose and then you move house uh, that data needs to be updated and it is the data holders responsibility to update that data and you say we will send you a prize if we give up your data. yeah okay um, Personal data uh, process for any purposes will not be kept longer than necessary. You, if you, once you've done the thing that you need to do, you get rid of the data. Anyone who has data held by someone else is allowed to request uh, to see what data is held, and they are also allowed to request that that data is removed. Okay. Now, bear in mind, it might be that if the, you can only use the service if uh, they also hold your data so you're more than within your rights to request that, that data is removed but then obviously you acknowledge the fact that you're no longer allowed to use that service um, and uh, your personal data is not allowed to be transferred to a, another country um, now for us it's not allowed to be transferred to another country outside the EU we're allowed to transfer it to different countries within the EU because all of the member states of the EU um, abide by the the GDPR okay so there are punishments there are substantial punishments now um, thanks to GDPR 
the uh, punishment to an organization uh, if they allow data to fall into the wrong hands they don't adequately protect it they can be fined up to 20 million euros that is a lot of money and in the past it's always been the company that has been liable but now it's individuals within the company uh, which is something that puts the willies up people because that's quite scary uh, but if you just make sure that data is is protected and you get rid of the data that you don't need anymore you know you don't have anything to worry about and that's again part of your good network policy should be making sure that it abides by the data protection laws of the country okay la, 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 la. next one uh, copyrights designs and patents act someone tell me what the copyrights designs and patents act is uh, there to do what does it protect what's it what's it allow What about original material? Stop people from using your eyings. Designs, yes. Uh, you can no, 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 no. Right, okay. Let's 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 get this let's get this profit thing sorted out here. Okay, so the only thing that Copyright Designs and Patents Act guarantees is that the original creator of a work has control over how that work is used. Okay, so if you create something, no one else is allowed to use that thing unless you say that they can use it. Okay, it doesn't mean that you are guaranteed to get money from it. It doesn't. It 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 doesn't mean um, that uh, you can you you have to charge money for it. You can give it away for free. All it means is that you, as the creator, have the control over how that thing is used. Okay. Now, it also obviously means that uh, if you find a work on the internet, you are not allowed to use it unless you have permission of the copyright holder. Now, there are some exceptions. Okay. Um, now it's worth noting that the exceptions to American copyright law are not the same as the exceptions uh, to um, uh, UK copyright law. Okay, so there are some exceptions. Um, you are allowed to um, use the uh, stuff for uh, private study or research. You're allowed to use it in an educational context. Um, However, if you use it educational use, I don't think you are then allowed to broadcast it. Um, so, uh, uh, if if I violated copyright on this, uh, I I apologise. Please don't sue me. Um, okay. Um, you are allowed to do a public reading of a poem as long as you acknowledge the uh, the the copyright holder. Um, I. Apparently, you're allowed to record folk songs. Now, you're not allowed to necessarily make cover versions of existing songs. That would fall under copyright, unless you have the permission of the copyright holder. Okay, So, I mean, it's a quagmire of stuff that you can and can't do. Okay, No worries. If you've got to go, that's fine. You'll be able to tune in and, and get the rest of it like once we're, once we're all done. Okay? No worries. Um, so... There is a Wikipedia page all about the Copyrights, Designs and Patents Act. I would recommend that you have a look at that. Okay, I've posted it in the in the chat for you. It's worth worth having a look there. Okay, because there are some uh, there are some exceptions. Okay. Uh, I mean, I think copyright should be a standard. I think copyright should be abolished. Personally, I think it. Uh, it used to serve a purpose, but it's been perverted. It no longer serves the purpose it originally intended for. The original purpose of copyright was to encourage um, more creativity. Um, but what it does now is it ensures profits for people that, in many cases, didn't even create the work. Because it used to be copyright was valid for like 15 years after the work was created. Now it's valid for the lifetime of the creator plus 50 years. So technically you still hold the copyright for something 50 years after you've died which makes no sense unless you start considering the fact that every time Mickey Mouse is due to enter public domain copyright mysteriously seems to get extended hmm uh, now on the subject of that copyright abolition 
there is this thing called Creative Commons licensing, which you need to know about. Okay, Creative Commons licensing is similar to copyright, and I think it's a really good thing. Um, so the way that Creative Commons works is you still have control over how your work is used, but you are able uh, to say, right, this is my work, you can use it however you want as long as you don't profit from it. Or you can say, this is my work, you can use it however you want as long as you don't make derivative works. Or you can say, you can do what you want with this as long as you give attribution. Okay, so if you go to, I uh, can't remember the actual uh, Creative Commons uh, website. Um, uh, it's creativecommons.org, of course it is. Um, there is a whole bunch of, um, let me see if I can find the, uh, uh, so if you want to allow adaptations of your work to be shared, so that means someone can take your work and they can remix it. Okay, uh, they, or they could use it as part of a mashup. Let's say we do want that. Okay, now there's two options. There's yes, you can allow it. No, you don't want to allow it. Or, and this is the best one, I think. Yes, as long as other people allow others to make remixes of their work. Okay, and this is this is fundamentally what the whole open source software movement is based on. So, you can make changes, um, and then anyone else can make changes. But if they make changes, they have to allow anyone else to make changes to those changes as well. Okay, it means that no one then holds uh, any particular sway over the um, over the uh, the license. You can say, do you want uh, do you want to allow um, commercial use of your work? If you don't want anyone to profit from it, you can click on no. If you do want people to profit from it, you can click on yes. Now it's worth noting if you license something under Creative Commons, you still also hold the copyright on it as well. Okay. Yes, Cory Doctorow releases a lot of stuff under Creative Commons, and you should totally read uh, Little Brother uh, and Homeland as well, the sequel. Um, uh, let me just find the link. So if you haven't read it yet, uh, you can you can add it to your reading list. Uh, let's go download my books. So Cory Doctorow. Um, he releases quite a lot of books under uh, Creative Commons. Um, where is it? Uh, be, uh, sorry, Little Brother. Little Brother. Um, here we go. So, for instance, I'm going to boom right there you can get little brother for free from there okay it's link it's it's shared under creative commons cory doctorow is generally a bit of a dude uh and it's wealth it's well worth reading his stuff um so creative commons it will allow you to um it allows you more freedom over uh what you can do with your work and also it allows freedom for others to do things with your work uh which is uh, a lot less restrictive uh than than copyright okay uh you need to know about creative commons generally speaking it allows you to um select whether other people can use your work whether they can use it whether they can earn money from it or not uh whether uh, they can make changes but also uh, you need to make sure that uh you know any changes that they make they then allow other people to um uh to to make those changes as well um Yes, I 100% agree with um, uh, Lord Siron here. If I pronounced your name wrong, that is, uh, uh, I apologise, but obviously that's, I know who you are. Uh, right, the last one is the Freedom of Information Act. Um, can someone tell me what the Freedom of Information Act is all about? We're going to have to wrap this up in about 10 minutes at the latest because I've realised that it's... Uh, uh, can we use this video for commercial purposes? No, I've licensed it under Creative Commons, so you uh, you cannot... Um, okay, what does the what is the Freedom of Information Act? Uh, not just from governments. You can request information from um, many places, not just governments.
Uh, I'm just going to have a look at the specifics of the United Kingdom Freedom of Information Act. So, okay, so it's not, it is not companies, okay, it is not just the government, it is any public uh, authorities, okay, so um, that might be uh, local councils, it might be the local school board, anything which is a, uh, a, a public um Anything that's a, a, a public organization, you can request information from them. But they only have to give that information if it's actually in the public interest. Okay, um, so um, let me just see what it says here. Because it's different for every country and it's so easy to find information about the American Freedom of Information Act. Um, so you've just got, you've got to be a little bit you got to be a little bit careful here. Um, so certain information can only be obtained under the Environmental Information Regulations Act. So it's not a case of, hey, I want to find out this stuff from the government, so I'm going to use the Freedom of Information Act to get that stuff. It's more of a case of, right, I think there's some dodgy shenanigans going on here, and it's in the public interest to find out what that information is, so I am going to put in a Freedom of Information Act request, and as long as my reasoning is valid, they have to give me that information. Okay. Um, in terms of police cases, they don't always have to um, submit the. Inf they don't always have to uh, return the information. There is a big caveat uh, with police cases. Um, in fact, let me just find that information. Police. Um, so, public authorities. Here we go. In principle, I'm reading from Wikipedia here. In principle, the Freedom of Information Act applies to all public authorities within the United Kingdom. A full list of public authorities for the purpose of the Act is included in Schedule 1. So, if you actually read the Act of Law, you can see what is available. Government departments, the Houses of Parliament, the Northern Ireland Assembly, the Welsh Assembly, the Armed Forces, local government bodies, national health service bodies, schools, colleges and universities, police authorities and chief officers of police are included within this list, which ranges from the Farm Animal Welfare Council to the Youth Council for Northern Ireland. A few government departments are expressly excluded from the scope of the Act, principally intelligence services, which stands to reason. It's not like you're going to write to MI6 and say, can I have some information? Information on like what you're what you guys are, are, are doing okay um, so there are an awful lot of things uh, that um, you know authorities that you can um, uh, that you can apply to I'm just double checking this stuff about the uh, the police thing uh, it doesn't actually say I do you know I I in my mind I'm thinking that um, the police do not have to uh, surrender information for a currently ongoing case, uh, but uh, if it's a um, uh, if it's if it is a, uh, um, a a concluded case, then they they can. Um, can they not just say no? I don't think it's within the public interest. Yeah, yes, they can, but it's not them that makes the decision whether it's in the public interest or not. It's not the organisation that makes the decision. It's the judiciary. Does that make sense? No one said anything. Just say they don't have it. Well, if they say they don't have it, then that's they're going to be liable for fraud. Um because the the thing is, it's it's not like it's not like you send a Freedom of Information Act request and then you leave it up to them to do it. You send a Freedom of Information Act request and then someone comes around and says, "We need this information. Give it to us right now." Yeah. <laughs> yeah, or just delete it. Okay. Um. So um. Yeah. Okay. So 
hopefully you've now got a better understanding of all these acts of law that you need to know about okay um, the main ones you're likely to be quizzed on are the CMA and the uh, Copyrights Designs and Patents Act you might be asked about a DPA although it probably won't be specifics about UK DPA um, there might be some stuff about the Freedom of Information Act although I don't recall ever seeing anything in there but you know you never know um, so just before we wrap this up, I've got a couple of case studies that we can go through. So we can, uh, we've been through these before, but hopefully you'll have a better understanding now of what these are. So we'll go through a couple of these case studies and you can, um, uh, you can let me know which acts of law have been violated and by whom. Uh, so the first one. John is playing Call of Duty online, but he's not very good, and he keeps getting killed by XXX Death Cloud XXX. Uh, John gets so frustrated that he looks up XXX Death Cloud XXX's IP address, which he manages to find listed alongside all of XXX Death Cloud XXX's other details on the official Microsoft website, and posts it on an online hacking forum. A hacker named Dr. Destructo uses this IP address to access XXX Death Cloud XXX's computer. Dr. Destructo then makes a backup of XXX Death Cloud XXX's desktop wallpaper and changes it to a custom image. Okay, so what laws have been violated there and who has violated them? Okay, so we've got Computer Misuse Act, Data Protection Act. Who has violated each of those? Who is liable? So, let's have a look at this. So, John has looked up XXX Death Cloud XX, sorry, XXX Death Cloud XXX's IP address, right? He manages to find that list alongside all of the other details on the Microsoft website. So Microsoft, Microsoft are the ones that have violated the Data Protection Act because they have not adequately protected XXX Death Cloud XXX's other details. Okay, now the hacker called Dr. Destructo uses the IP address to access the computer. So Dr. Destructo has violated the Computer Misuse Act. John has not violated any acts of law here. Okay, he has looked up the IP address. That's easy to find. That's public information. That's not misusing any uh, any. Uh, computers there uh, and he has managed to find this information and then he's hired this guy to, to hack into it so John although John has been the sort of instigator of all of this he has not actually violated the law Microsoft have be, uh, by not adhering to the Data Protection Act and Dr. Destructo has by uh, has violated the um, uh, computer Misuse Act by um, uh, uh, accessing the computer. Surely Dr. Destructo has violated the DPA as he has a backup. Um, uh, no, that is not... That's let's be, let's be careful here. Making a backup of the desktop, that's not the same as holding someone's personal data. It's not like Dr. Destructo went round... Um, uh, XXX Death Cloud XXX's house and said, "Hi, can you sign up for this hack attempt? Can I s store your data?" That's 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 not that, okay? Right. So it's worth noting as well, even though Doctor Destructo made a backup, he still illegally accessed that computer and he has still caused damage. Okay. So there's that first one. Next up. Case 2. Rajesh wants to make a new video for his e-learning series about computer science. He finds a great video on YouTube and emails the creator asking permission to use it. He doesn't get a response, but the video says it's licensed under Creative Commons, so he uses it anyway. Inside the video is a clip from the popular movie Cyborg Cop, which is an amazing film by the way. Um, the original creator of the video claims to have permission to use it, so Rajesh figures it, figures it will be okay. What laws have been broken and who has broken them? The YouTube. Well, bear in mind, YouTube is not responsible for this. Original guy 
the original guy that created it potentially has violated the uh, Computer Misuse Act. If he's used that clip from Cyborg Cop, uh, and he doesn't have permission. I mean, he might claim to have permission, but that's no guarantee that he has. Um, if he's used that without permission, then yes, he has violated it. Um, Rajesh has also violated uh, the uh, um, uh, Copyright Designs and Patents Act. Although the, uh, the YouTube clip that he is using, that's licensed under Creative Commons, so he doesn't need to ask the permission of the guy, he just needs to attribute uh, the, the creation. The Because it contains this uh, clip from Cyborg Cop, Rajesh still needs the um, Raja still needs the permission from the copyright holder originally uh, in order to use that. Uh, Charlie raises a very good point. What Creative Commons licensing is it? It doesn't actually say. Uh, we can assume that it's just Creative Commons attribution. Uh, that's the default one. Okay, so um, attribution, it probably actually it's, it's Creative Commons attribution non-commercial. Uh, but we don't actually know. So that's a very good point. In order to uh, to understand like whether he's uh, within his rights under Creative Commons, we need to make sure that uh, we know exactly which Creative Commons license has been used. Yeah, and our YouTube uses the algorithms instead of people, and the algorithms are fallible, so sometimes you get false positives. Um, sometimes they're ludicrous as well. Um, uh, I've had copyright claims against me for uh, stuff which wasn't even a copyrighted piece of, uh, of music, uh, which is very, very odd. Okay, so let's move on to case study three. This is the third case study, and after that we will wrap it up for the night because it's just gone nine o'clock. Okay, uh, so case study three. Sandra used to attend Green Hat School five years ago, and she's just completed a degree in computer science. She decides to test her skills and attempts to access the school network from her house. To her surprise, she discovers that her old login details from five years ago are still in use and all of her old files are present. Using a link on the public school website, Sandra accesses the school student database and discovers that student information dating back to 1998 is still stored. What uh, laws have been violated and who has broken those laws? Okay, so we've got... We've got here, definitely the school is in violation of data protection. Why is the school in violation of data protection, though? What is the, what's the part of the Data Protection Act that the school has violated here? Yes, it's, it's, it's got old data. That data should have been removed once Sandra left the school. It's no longer required. Okay, so that's one violation. Uh, but also, not just Sandra's information. Look, information dating back to 1998 is still stored there. Um, that's obviously going back a long way. Um, so, um, we've got the interesting conundrum here. Has Sandra violated the Computer Misuse Act? Just just sound off in the comments. Just say yes or no if you think Sandra has violated the Computer Misuse Act. <laughs> it's interesting. This is a tricky one because Sandra has just used her old login details. If they still work, then technically that's authorised. But if you were to go to the school and say, does Sandra still have access to the computer? They would probably say, no, she's no longer authorised. So this is, this is a difficult one because she sort of... It's kind of borderline whether she did or not. Okay, now in the exam, you're not going to get a question like this, which is, you, you will get stuff which is much more clean cut. But remember, 
It's very difficult to convict under the Computer Misuse Act because of lack of evidence. It's equally difficult to convict in situations like this because it's not really clear whether that's a violation of the Computer Misuse Act or not. She has attempted to gain access to a system which she believes she no longer has access to. But then she's discovered that she actually still has access to it. So, I don't know. I, you'd be equally justified in saying... Uh, Yes, she has violated it, or no, she hasn't. So it's that's that's a difficult one. The fact that she attempted to gain access could potentially flag up the fact that she has has broken it. Okay. Right. That was a whistle stop tour of the law. Um, we didn't have time to get into the ethics and, and whatnot. We didn't look at system architecture. Now, if you want to find out more about system architecture, there is a video on this channel about um, uh, system architecture. Um, so you can, you can have a look at that. Uh, <laughs> guitar, guitar. I mean, um, I snapped a string on my 12 string, so it's going to have to be 6 string, I'm afraid. Um, Let's see if I can... Uh. Here we go. Guitar. Yeah, I've got a 12-string guitar. Gent God, that's right. It's a 12-string acoustic guitar. Uh, so if you like gent folk, I guess that's... Oh, this is terribly out of tune. that song in ages that was some green day for you do you like green day there you go uh play some mesh sugar yeah okay whatever um <laughs> um uh i i mean let's see uh if, if i sing it's going to be way too loud so you know that's that's just going to be bad um um uh, what about do, 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 do. nope that's not going to work Um, that was Breaking Benjamin. Um, so, like I said, uh, I can't sing quiet. Um, so, I don't know, maybe I'll have to bring my guitar in and play for you one lunchtime. Uh... All right, I tell you what, if you do well in your exam, okay, what Breaking Benjamin song was it? It was so cold. Um, so, I, I tell you what, I, don't know if you'll still be able to hear this if I put the mic on the side. Uh, the mic on the side there. Perhaps. Still hear that? That sound alright?
There you go. Uh, maybe I should, maybe I should organise something with the music department, right? Uh. Cool. Well, thank you very much for watching, everybody. Um, hopefully, this has given you a lot more. Uh, information on all of the stuff that you need to know. Yeah, that was Breaking Benjamin. It was my acoustic version of So Cold, uh, which is normally like pretty, um, uh, pretty amped up and heavy. Um, I have, I, I mean, I was going to play one of my own songs, but it's a bit sweary. So, um, so there you go. Um, <laughs> if there's a market for uh, uh, Mr. Smith's music stream. Uh, then, uh, then, then, there you go. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll do some, uh, some music streams. Anyway, um, if there's any other questions that you have between now and Monday, please drop me a line. Uh, I will be in school from 7:30 a.m. on uh, Monday for some extra revision. Um, uh, I will be in C3 at lunchtime and after school tomorrow. Uh, make a phone, people, if you want to uh, come along. I'm, uh, I am planning on doing some stuff after school tomorrow with soldering and whatnot. Uh, phones have still not yet arrived, but they are on their way. So um, there you go. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. And I shall see you tomorrow, probably. Do, do, do. Goodbye.